I'd like you all to participate in a little imagination exercise. So what image comes to mind when I say police officer? What about nurse? And what about computer scientist? So I'd like you to hold those images in your mind for a few minutes. I'll return to them later in the talk. Go ahead and take a look at this graph. This is the proportion of undergraduate degrees granted to women since the 1970s in fields like biology, chemistry, and math. And what you'll notice here is that there's been some profound changes in society. Women have entered these fields in greater numbers to the point where they're at near parity in chemistry and math, and they're actually making up the majority of undergraduate degrees received in biology. But this turns out not to be the full story. Let's take a look at another field. This is computer science. And what you can see here is that women are making up a much smaller proportion of the undergraduate degrees granted in computer science. And you'll also notice there's this interesting decline that happened in the 1980s. I'll return to the matter of the decline towards the end of my talk, but what I'm interested in in my research is trying to understand why women are underrepresented in computer science and what we can do to change it. Now before I get to that why, I think there's another why that's important to address first, and that is the why do we care? Why do we want more women in computer science in the first place? And the way I see it, there's really two reasons. The first reason is that it's important to have a diverse workforce in this country in order to ensure our competitiveness and innovation. And this is especially important for a field like computer science because computer scientists are in many ways the modern architects of society. Making sure that women are at the table will ensure that their perspectives are incorporated into these future designs. The second reason is because computer science jobs, as many of you know, are among the highest status, most lucrative, and flexible jobs in this country, and women may be missing out on jobs that are potentially very good for them. So computer science is a great field for both women and men. Why are there not more women in it? Um, well, this is a complex problem with multiple explanations, and some of these explanations might have already occurred to you. For instance, women and girls are often socialized away from technology at a young age by people like their parents or their teachers or other people who might think that women are not suited for technology or in some ways not as good at technology as men. Um, also, you might notice that whereas biology, chemistry, and math are classes that are often required or at least offered at the high school level, computer science is a class that often isn't mandatory and isn't sometimes even offered at the high school level. But what I wondered as someone who studies stereotypes is might the assumptions or stereotypes that students have about who computer scientists are and what computer science, scientists do contribute to the gender disparities in the field? So stereotypes have been defined as pictures in the head. Um, and the, the place these stereotypes originate from can be varied. Um, one of the things I wondered is, um, what are these stereotypes of computer scientists that might be turning women away? And the New York Times ran an article on this a few years ago about the underrepresentation of women in computer science. And they noticed that when high school girls think of computer scientists, they often think of geeks, pocket protectors, isolated cubicles, and a lifetime of staring into a screen writing computer code. They called this the nerd factor. Now, um, it's important to note that these are stereotypes, meaning that they're generalizations that are often applied to the group as a whole, um, and they can have no basis in reality. In fact, if we look at real computer scientists, you might recognize some of these people. They're people who've changed computer science and changed the world in some way. You'll see that they don't really fit this image that high school girls have in their head of what computer scientists look like and what they do. Um, but what's important about this is that these perceptions can still be very powerful, even if they're completely divorced from reality. They can determine people's attitudes, their behaviors, and the, the choices that they make. So where do these misperceptions come from? Well, um, we start pretty young in the society exposing people to images of professions. And we did a survey of children's books to see what kinds of professions came up. And when we did that, we saw a lot of pictures that look like this. So you can see you've got the pilot, the police officer, um, a farmer. Um, this one is kind of interesting. A lot of engineers in children's books are portrayed as train engineers. And some of my students have told me that they didn't realize that engineers don't work on trains uh, often <laughs> until they were teenagers. Um, and then you'll see that the lone woman in the group is portrayed as a nurse. And it's not only at the, at the children level that we're exposed to these images, it also carries over to when we're adults. Um, I took this last profession here, nurse, and I did a Google search. I just entered the word nurse into Google Images and just to see what kind of cultural images are circulating in our society. And these are the first images that came up when I typed in nurse into Google Images. 
And what you can see here is very few real nurses and a lot of highly stereotypical images of what nurses look like and also no male nurses, so, um, which is interesting. So you don't have to be Googling these types of careers to see what kinds of images come up. You can just be crossing a street here in Seattle. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Pemco Northwest Profiles ads. Um, and this is their ad for the ponytailed software geek. So this is, um, he's someone who's spotted in cubicles. He eats nacho chips and uh, drinks highly caffeinated soda. And they say in the description that um, he's an avid fantasy gamer and he um, is proficient in programming languages and also speaks fluent Klingon, which is a Star Trek language. Um, and what I'm interested in is, do images like this that we see in our society, do they affect who's interested in going into these fields? And can we broaden the image so that we can welcome and make it a more inclusive image so that people don't feel like they have to be a gamer or speak Klingon to be a good computer scientist? Um, so one of the things I wondered was, how can we change this image? And I thought, well, we can use the media so we can change the billboards and change the children's books. But I also wondered, can we change environments to change, um, to change this image? And the reason that I was interested in environments is because um, when I was a... Uh, um, living here in Seattle and before that living in the Bay Area, I had the chance to visit many tech companies. And what I noticed is that some of the tech companies really fit the stereotypes. And so they looked something like this. This is actually from a documentary filmed in Silicon Valley in the late 90s, um, where they went around and just filmed what different companies look like. And you can see that some of them really fit this image. They, you know, you see the action figures, the Nerf gun, the soda can stacked up um, to make formation of a Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and other companies, though, I noticed many other tech companies didn't fit this image at all. So here's some pictures from um, Microsoft, so it doesn't look like that. Also some photos from Google, which also looks quite different. Um, and this wasn't only at the company level that I noticed this. When I visited my own um, UW computer science department, what I noticed was that they also didn't really fit this stereotype. This, these are some photos from our computer science building over at the University of Washington. And um, when I inquired further, I learned that the uh, percentage of women that are in the UW computer science department is actually higher than the national average of um, women in computer science and other departments in this country. And so I thought to myself, okay, well, it could be the case that when women enter a field, maybe the environment changes to be less stereotypical, but it could also be the case that starting off with an environment that doesn't look stereotypical might also draw more women into the field. And in order to investigate this latter hypothesis, I did some experiments. Um, so what I did is I created two environments. Um, we took a classroom in the Gates Computer Science Building at Stanford, and we created a stereotypical version and a non-stereotypical version of that classroom. And the way we did that is that we asked undergraduates to tell us what objects they associate with computer science majors. And they gave us the standard stereotypical responses, things like Star Trek and Star Wars posters, um, uh, soda cans, science fiction books, computer parts. So we actually collected those objects and then we put them in this classroom and this is what that classroom looked like. And then what we did is we wanted to also create a non-stereotypical version of that classroom and so we took the same classroom and we just redecorated it and this time we put objects that weren't associated with the computer science stereotype in the minds of our students. And so we had objects instead, things like nature posters, um, books that weren't science fiction books, so things like phone books and um, novels and then we had water bottles. Um, and what we did is we had undergraduates who were not computer science majors because we were really interested in the question of recruiting people into computer science as opposed to um, people who are already there. And so we had them come into this room. They either sat in the room when it looked stereotypical or not. And then we asked them how interested they were in computer science and how well they thought they would do there. Now, we've also done this a few other ways. We've done it by having people simply imagine the room. So we tell them, imagine you're interested in taking an introductory computer science class. And um, you, know, you visit the classes, and the one classroom looks stereotypical, so it has these objects in it. And the other classroom has these other objects in it. And we just tell them what those objects are. And we ask them how interested they would be in um, taking that class and how well they would do in it. And then most recently, we've, used to actually, we've moved to actually creating these environments in Second Life, which is an online 3D interactive a virtual environment and this allows us to have a lot of control over the experiment and it's also important because universities are actually starting to hold classes in Second Life and so understanding how the design of these virtual environments impacts students learning is going to be something important to discover. Now across all of our studies we find very similar results um, in terms of 
when we ask people what class they'd rather choose, these are the types of results we get. So we see that um, women have usually a strong preference for the non-stereotypical environments. So they'd rather take that computer science class when it doesn't look like the current stereotypes. Whereas men seem to typically have a preference for the stereotypical rooms. So they'd rather take that class when it resembles the stereotypes. In terms of performance, um, when we ask people how well they think they do, we see that women think they'll actually do better when the room doesn't look stereotypical, whereas men think that they'll do equally well, regardless of what the room looks like. And that's important because what we know from future work in psychology, uh, sorry, past work in psychology, is that um, how you expect to do in a certain environment can actually predict how you actually do. Now, one thing that's important to note about these uh, results and about all of the results that we get is that we always have a core subset of women who like the stereotypical room, just as we always have a core subset of men who like the non-stereotypical room. So when we're talking about women's preferences or t women tend to do one thing or the other, it's never that all women do like one thing and all men like something else. We always see variability within our genders. Um, but, and what's important about this is that if we can broaden the current stereotypes of computer science to have a broader image, we might actually be able to attract some men into computer science who otherwise would not be interested in it. So one of the things I get um, asked is, well, why, what is it about these objects that might be communicating to women that they don't belong in, in that environment? And um, what we see in our studies is that both men and women perceive the stereotypical room to be a masculine one, so that's, that's how they rate it. Um, and for women, the more they see it as masculine, the less interested they are in it, and the less they feel like they fit in it. And um, it makes sense that people can decide whether or not they fit in an environment based on the objects in it. Um, you can think about the last time that you visited a new town or a new city, and if you're anything like me, you probably, you know, as soon as you land and you start driving through the streets of the town, you start thinking, is this a place that I could see myself living in, or is this some place that I feel like I could fit? And you're probably not, like, using facts about the city, like looking up the city government on Wikipedia or, you know, stopping people who live in the city to ask them how they like it. Um, what you're probably doing is just looking around, looking around at the neighborhoods, the buildings, the shops, the, the cars, and deciding is this a place where you might feel like you fit, like you might feel like there's people like you there. Um, when I first visited Seattle, actually, I, I noticed all the yoga studios and the running stores and the ski racks on people's cars, and I, I thought to myself, hey, I think I could really see myself here. I think there's probably a lot of people like me in Seattle. And we think it's a similar process for the, for the participants in our experiment. And we've come to call this in my lab ambient belonging. The sense that you can walk into an environment, see the objects around you, and kind of get a sense about whether you fit in an environment and whether you would fit with the people that you imagine to be in that environment. Okay, so I promised I would return to this graph and the matter of the decline in the proportion of women pursuing um, uh, getting computer science degrees in uh, the 1980s. And when we look at this graph, it's really tempting for me to point out that the inflection point in the 80s here also corresponded to the release of some um, pivotal 80s geek movies, like Revenge of the Nerds, Real Genius, and Weird Science. So one possibility is that it was around this time that the image of the computer geek, these stereotypes, really crystallized in our society. But whatever the reason for the decline, um, what's important to note is that there's a disconnect between people's perceptions of computer science and what computer science is really like. And this disconnect may be contributing to some of the gender disparities in the field. Um, but what I hope I've shown is that this image is malleable, that we can reimagine this image, that we can use the media and the environments and other types of interventions to try to broaden this image to, to hopefully attract more people into the field. And I'd also point out that I think another worthwhile intervention is the one that you're all participating in right now, and that is spreading the word about how these stereotypes are inaccurate and how people can um, come to make decisions based on stereotypes that might not be true. Hopefully we can convince students to really get to know a field in depth before deciding where to stake their futures. Thank you. Mm -hmm.